Natalie Hari, please educate me on where you are joining from. Vandana Bante, I'm in New Mexico, Santa Fe. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> I was there once. The UPA Zen Center is uh, there. There's where I'm at. Yeah, that's <laughs> it's a beautiful <laughs> place. It blended with nature. Yes. <laughs> Okay, Dave says um, we are live now. Uh, let's begin by paying homage to the Buddha and saying Namo Tassa together. <clears throat> Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sam Buddhate Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sam Buddhate Namo Tatsa Bhagavato Arehatu Samma Sam Buddhate Homage to him, to the Blessed One, Worthy One, to the Fully Enlightened, one sadhu 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 welcome everyone for the 51st uh, zoom sutra discussion and this one also is done um, without bante sannapala he is visiting bangladesh uh, his home country uh, and i see him doing many uh, dhamma services uh, although we miss him here in Canada, uh, we look forward to welcoming him back to Canada very soon and continuing these Dhamma services he has been doing. So for this discussion, we have uh, several monks joining from different parts of the world. Uh, I, I see that uh, monks must be busy today that only few monks have joined for this discussion or maybe they are thinking that this sutra is too simple and a few monks can figure it out and they don't need to participate. <laughs> Whatever the case it is, uh, I'm so delighted to welcome the venerable monks who are present, who are joining this discussion today. Like usual, I'm very, very uh, honored to introduce the Venerable Monks who are on the screen on video at this moment. Venerable Bhante Santa Sobana joining from Los Angeles, California, USA. Welcome Bhante to this discussion. And then we have Bhante Kalubovila Ananda joining from Cambridge, Canada. Uh, welcome Bhante. Thank you for joining. And then we have Bhante Sanata Vihari joining from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Welcome Bhante to this discussion. He's joining from uh, the Upaya Zen Center uh, in New Mexico. So for today's discussion, we have a very interesting uh, subject that is about patience and loving kindness, which are very uh, useful tools for monks to have. Uh, without patience, I don't think loving kindness can exist. And without loving kindness, I don't think patience can exist. And we have this popular saying that patience lead to Nibbana, to the final peace. Uh, so when we have patience, uh, it is easy to wait but 
that's easy part that's the easy part the difficult part is the attitude that you have in your mind when you have patience so waiting with a good wholesome attitude in mind for things to happen and there you see how beautiful patience is as a virtue so patience therefore is called the highest virtue that one can have and we lose temp we we lose temper we lose our patience when we are criticized and there is a case of a monk in majjhima nikaya number 21 kakka chupama sutta simile of the soul where this monk uh, is the subject of discussion today uh, and i think without me explaining any further i'd like to see if any of the venerable monks who are present today would like to jump in and uh, maybe give an introduction uh, taking uh, any length of time that you like or just jumping in and just starting from wherever you like to start and then we will uh, keep filling in the information uh, and uncovering the important parts of this sutra uh, any of the venerable monks can speak maybe i can continue what i have been explaining so that way you will find a moment to get an entry to the discussion so in kakkacha upama sutta uh, kakkacha is a two handed saw uh, a wooden saw so upama means the simi the parable and the buddha himself named this sutra as the kakkacha upama sutta because Uh, this parable is found at the end of the sutra uh, it it the parable itself says uh, that even in very difficult circumstances such as your limbs being cut by a saw you practice patience you have an attitude of loving kindness in your mind you are not shaken in your mind you stay patient you radiate loving kindness to that person who is doing such harm to your body and there is a case of a monk called moliya pagguna he had this habit of visiting the community of nuns a little too often than other monks did so when the moliya pagguna uh, goes to advise the bikkhuni nuns and having uh, gone to the community of nuns venerable Mo- moliya pagguna uh, spent too much time there and then some monks made it a case and brought it to the buddha uh, especially when these monks went to moliya venerable moliya pagguna first and said you know it would be nice if you cut down your over association with these nuns maybe they want to they want some space for themselves that they want to practice the teachings that you have been giving and you know what happened when the moliya pagguna was extremely upset and he started being toxic and on top of being toxic he started using abusive language uh not accepting the constructive criticism given to him by the other monk so when you are living in a community with the other monk it is natural that they observe what you are doing and then they tend to give a little tap on the shoulder and say you know it'd be nice for you if you focus on yourself instead of trying to teach nuns all the time but when this advice came from the community of monks some of his spiritual companions when the moliya pagguna was upset and he used abusive language 
that's the easy way to use abusive language to criticize those monks. And this became a case and was brought to the Buddha. And when the Buddha heard this, he said, go back and uh, tell Molya Bhagguna that his teacher is calling him. And when Molya Bhagguna reached the Buddha and the Buddha asked, is that true that you are over-associating the nuns? And then Venerable Molya Bhagguna said, yes. It is true. And is it true that you use, you get very upset and use abusive language when you are confronted, when you are told not to over associate the nuns? And Venerable Molya Paguna said, yes, uh, some incidents happened. You know, they were unavoidable. I was upset. I acted in anger. In that situation, the Buddha said, no, you should not act with anger. You should always use loving kindness when others address you timely or untimely which means they may say something that is appropriate to the time or they may say something that is not appropriate to the time and psychologically imagine you are being in an upset situation your day is not going well you are having a terrible day and someone says something and boom, you are ready to explode. There's this experience of meltdown, anger reaction uh, that happens in you and you start blaming it on everything and everyone without noticing that it is your day that went wrong somewhere and that you are reacting overly out of emotions, believing that these emotions are true. Uh, sometimes people say things that are true about you. Sometimes they say things that are not so true about you. The Buddha said, you should not be upset when someone says something true about you or something not true about you. So this goes on and on like that. And the Buddha gives a simile, a story here first. Um, the story is that there was this lady called Vedeka. Uh, she was very popular in the neighborhood as someone who had patience, someone who never got angry. And um, she had a servant girl named Kali. And Kali knew that uh, her, her boss was popular for her patience and that she never got angry. So Kali wanted to prove uh, she wanted to know for herself whether it is her good work that makes Vedeka uh, patient. And having um, thought about that, Kali decided to uh, sleep a little late on the next day. And when uh, Vedeka realized that Kali did not wake up on time, uh, she asked, Hey, Kali. What's the matter, lady? Why did you wake up so late? And now Kali can see that slowly uh, her boss is upset and getting angry. And Kali realized that this is uh, this trick is working. And the following day she woke up even later and Vedika was even more upset. And on the third day, Kali woke up super late and Vedeka took a rolling pin and gave a big blow on, on the head of Kali and Kali's head split and started bleeding. And she ran to the neighborhood and said, look at this lady's work. She was, she was popular for her patience. She was popular as a calm one. Look what she did to me. And immediately after that, there was this bad reputation about Vedeka spread in the neighborhood that Vedika is not patient, she is not a calm lady, she is anger driven and she she's abusive and she does not treat people very well. So sometimes without us knowing that we ourselves, you know, we are patient and we think we are patient, without knowing that we are patient because our teacher has made all the arrangements for us to receive dana for us to receive all the 
requisites and has made an environment for us to practice meditation. So everything goes well and our mind is, stays calm. But then there comes a time when the teacher is absent that things start to not go well in the monastery and we start reacting and getting irritated about every little thing. So then the teaching of the Kakachupama Sutta should come to our mind. So I think that's where I like to leave this um, sort of storytelling time. Maybe I can invite the other Venerables to jump in and um, maybe share a story about patience. And also uh, this sutra has several similes that I like to hear from the Venerables um, one by one and see the value of patience and the value of radiating loving kindness. Um, so over to any Venerable who likes to speak. Venerable Kalupo Vilananda raised his hand. Over to you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante, and thank you to everyone here. Uh, I think Bhante, it's a it's a very nice sutra, and uh, in fact, I wanted to point out on a few things. The first thing is that uh, um, we at the end of this uh, session also we say Kanti Paraman uh, Patience is the biggest uh, monkhood or the uh, path that you can lead, which which should eventually lead up to your enlightenment. And also, uh, uh, I find a very similar sutra which doesn't have a story per se, but which is more on the uh, discourse side, uh, Sabhasva Sutra, which uh, tells you few ways to uh, find this patience. And finally, uh, not only, you know, uh, not only patience, but how, how do you do it with uh, meaning, with wisdom, not just uh, uh, abstinence, but just doing it with uh, meaning and uh, um, a right view. Uh, and the second part, I think, is the most important part uh, in our lives. Uh, we are all okay until uh, unless we are disturbed. And I think that's the best part of, that I find in this sutra. Uh, a lot of us, we think that uh, we are calm, we are blissful. But the moment things started, uh, things starts to, uh, you know, go the wrong way, when it starts going south, then is uh, when our real nature comes out. And uh, not only for not only for your impatience or anger, but also for your um, agony and being disturbed. Uh, yesterday, just yesterday, I was uh, talking to someone whose father passed away, and he's someone who would come to temple very often. He knows a lot of dhamma, but yesterday he was really down. So I was telling him that this is the best time to practice your Buddhism because uh, there's no other time better than this when you're most affected. So regardless, uh, be it your anger, be it your uh, turbulent emotions, I think the best time to practice your mindfulness, Dhamma, and all this doctrine that we uh, discuss here and discuss is when there's something really bad. And uh, uh, then Buddha goes on to uh, further explaining it. But uh, there's also one thing. So when things happen, uh, the, the thinking of the Kali, the servant, what she's thinking is that, uh, is my uh, master, is she really uh, out of anger or is she pretending or if she's sort of, uh, 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 you know, just be patient. So Kali is really uh, testing her limits. Uh, what Kali did uh, sounds a little funny, but I think the more important lesson is for ourselves. Like uh, when we are embarking on a path of spiritual practice, um, you know, things become smooth and uh, all of a sudden they, you, you are a, you are this calm person where you don't have a, uh, you, you don't have anger, you don't have anything, you don't have the desires. Uh, and I, I experienced a similar thing when I initially got ordained. Right after three days of getting ordained, I went into a jungle cave temple. And uh, if you stay in a jungle for 10 days or 20 days, you automatically become calm because there's nothing there to uh, be, feel bad about. There's only elephants and monkeys and uh, uh, in the morning you can go and have your diksha. So there's absolutely very limited sensory input to make you disturbed. Also, you don't hear news. You don't see social media feeds. So you're very undisturbed. In fact, uh, there was this uh, uh, nun who spoke to me uh, just a few days ago. Uh, during the... Um, during the turbulence Sri Lanka had, during this uh, uprising Sri Lanka had, she was in the jungle, so she was cut out of all the information. And she absolutely had no idea what's happening in the outside world while everyone was uh, going with placards and uh, uh, making a huge fuss. She absolutely did not know uh, what is happening in the outside world. So she was calm, but it does not necessarily mean that her nature is calm by itself. Had she been exposed to all this information, maybe uh, she would react differently. 
and it's the same for everyone uh, being in a monkhood being in a path of uh, when you enroll for a path of spirituality it also gives you this uh, cocoon where you are separated from many things that uh, people outside that cocoon would feel um, and uh, and the other thing is that uh, when you declare yourself that you are a person who's being in a spiritual path be it a lay person or be it a uh, monk the society also give you that space they don't expect a lot of things out of you so that you get into that cocoon so personally what i uh, do time to time is that i check my limits am i really calm or is it an uh, artificially created uh, calmness so uh, from what kali did i think if uh, if the if the if that lady if she, if if she, if she can use it for her self actualization what her servant did was the best uh, Uh, the servant became the best teacher actually by doing that so i think we can use similar people associate uh, similar people who test our patience and test our limits that's it panthi thank you venerable uh, anand for this uh, very uh, insightful uh, piece of discussion uh, for this discussion uh, about the nun who uh, who was in the forest who was completely cut out uh, from all that you know the aragale period in sri lanka where people were protesting come into the street and um and doubting sometimes maybe she would have reacted with some um some anger maybe she would have not reacted with anger as well um that's the thought that uh, that came to my mind uh, but without knowing what her situation uh, of mind is uh, uh, we 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 may never know how to judge but it tells us a message that maybe whether our patience does not have to be um, affected by the circumstances that we live in this patience should always be there uh, whether we live in the forest or in a busy town where the hundreds the millions the gazillion things are happening in that case it it the underlying message is that it's a virtue that you cultivate and you have it all the time and the the desire to test it again uh, uh someone is very important we all need a kali in our life <laughs> a someone who is testing our patience all the time and pushing us to the limit so that we know that we are not losing it doesn't matter what how much pressure is put on us and we still know that the true value in us remains in how patient and how much loving kindness that we can cultivate and radiate to the world thank you so much for sharing that insight uh, today i know bante santosobanas hand it uh, raised and over to you bante thank you very much uh, venerable sirs and i think this is uh, one of uh, uh, important uh, topic because we need come to this uh, spiritual practice more than any other time in our, in our society we talk about this uh, compassion and loving kindness and because one thing is even though so much information we have we, we can see there are a lot of people how the silence disturb inside them and uh, especially when it come to spiritual practice sometimes people think when they come to spiritual practice the the society going to be nice for them and other people going to behave well around them and it not going to happen like that no. so it is very important to understand that according to the buddha's teaching how we can develop this loving kindness and compassion because uh, when it come to wisdom path this is one pillar that uh, we have to deeply understand so basically you know, one thing is we can uh, whoever listen this and if anybody uh, practicing loving kindness and meditation uh, actually it is a one important thing this all based with the uh, the idea of self so when we get out of the the idea of self and fundamentally we 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 slowly can develop the loving kindness and compassion 
And at the same time, what we can see through this sutra, we, because when it comes to the Mogaliya Pagguna, that venerable had a very good intention. And he was, uh, he was doing that all the, the activities with nuns and discussing the Dhamma with the good intention. But still some monks came and complained about it. So it, it can happen to us also because in, the, in, in, in our day-to-day -day life, sometimes we, we do things with the good intention. Maybe for some people, it's not going to be good like that. And then sometimes that our, our intention, our point of view, maybe it's kind of like a bounce back to us and disturb us. And because uh, we think, oh, I did it with the good heart, but uh, the people come against and then they start to kind of like uh, become difficult for us. So somehow, and what, out of this sutra, what we can get, it's not a kind of like the, that the, in day-to-day -day life, it is not something that what we think going to work end of the day, even for ourselves. Because when it comes to emotions, it's kind of like a deeper energy. So the current go through us, we, we can't see on the surface level. And sometimes we depend on others' opinion, like... Uh, what happened to Vedeka? Because she maybe she was nice because uh, she was a very rich woman and everybody appreciate her and she used to do that. And maybe she even didn't know who is inside her. And sometimes in a very comfortable zone, when comfortable situation, it can happen to us also when other people appreciate us, when, when other people say good things about us, we get lost in that situation sometimes. So when it comes to uh, practice that uh, it's the meditation or when you go through the spiritual practice, what happened, it gives us an opportunity to go beyond the thoughts and see this how this energy works inside us and recognize the what, from where this mental formations come and from there this, uh, the current come. So that is the very important thing. And that's why in, in this sutra, and the, there are some few things Buddha explained as similes. And it is very important. Why? Because it's not that uh, love, compassion or the loving kindness itself going to help us. It, the way we develop it, the way we nourish it, the way we bring it through us is going to help for us. So that's why out of this all, finally, we, we come to equanimity. So through this, that similis, uh, the Buddha explained how we can develop it in day-to-day -day life and uh, kind of like uh, uh, getting examples and rather than personalizing and clinging to a more bigger picture and seeing uh, the very first uh, simile that uh, uh, gave here is about the earth. Be like the earth. And the people put all the dirt and at the same time pay most valuable things also in this earth, on the, on the ground. But still, the earth itself doesn't care about it. It, it does, itself doesn't have any idea to reject it or to, to hold it. And the next one is the like the be like the water. So people put all the dirt to the water and uh, and the the whatever and as we know this big companies and where this all the consumer product and everything sometimes they they go, go into middle of the ocean and they dump dump everything and it's kind of like a, the in the part of the ocean there is a kind of like a junkyard <laughs> no one can go like beyond the sri lanka and in between the australia and sri lanka and so in the deep in the ocean because people put all the junk to that but still that uh, when we that the water itself has the ability to purify and at the same time it doesn't reject anything so the next one the like the fire so people put all the ba bad things and the dirty and to burn through through the fire and at the same time and people put some valuable things also like uh, gold when we want to transform the gold to something and all the irons, we use the fire and the, the ghee 
one of the most important that the uh, vitamin and the food that we have in the world. So people put it, but still the, the, the fire itself doesn't have any desire to reject anything or hold anything. So that is a one of the, the beautiful example that we have to reflect on. Another thing is the, the wind. So the wind blow every, for every direction without having any favor to any direction. And at the same time, it, it has ability to clean the environment. So without doing any favor to any place. So reflecting on that and thinking about it, it, it gives us a kind of like a picture for ourselves, how we can develop. Because when it comes to ourselves that uh, sometimes that what we think ourselves and what we reflect on ourselves and end of the day, when a situation comes, it becomes our dharma. It becomes our life. What we think we become. So when it comes to the world and when it comes to this everything, the most that the fundamental qualities is earth, water, fire, and the wind. Four elements. So if we reflect on that, if we clinging to that, and if we follow that nature, because it's it's within us also, we can bring it through us and in any situation, we can apply it. And that application, I think, going to be the best application in day-to-day -day life. And there are uh, some other similar examples that the Buddha gave. One is the, the cat skin bag. And the, the cat is the most smooth kind of like a skin that cat has. So if anybody make a cat skin bag and try to rub it and uh, thinking I'm going to to bring a kind of like a, a, a disturbed sound out of this. It's not going to happen. So, and uh, at the same way that uh, if anybody uh, think that uh, using any kind of that uh, the words or the actions, if anyone uh, disturb, and if we can reflect on that uh, simile and think that I'm not going to be like that way. I'm not going to re uh, react to any way that uh, bringing harm or the any kind of like a disturb to other people. So that will help us to, to develop our own inner qualities. So when it comes to Dharma, one of the things, because when we practice meditation, most of time, especially uh, when newcomers come, uh, right away they think this sitting and practicing and coming to temple or doing prayers uh, or doing chantings or listening to monks they think that the things going to change it's not like that it's not going to happen like that way if it is so world is more better place than this so we have to understand that end of the day we have to accept but bringing the change to ourselves and understanding ourselves and transforming ourselves is the best way to, to change this everything. So how we can transform that? The one of the major important quality we have to develop, the compassion and loving kindness. Why? Because the, the same way, anger, hatred, jealousy, that all so powerful around us. So it's going to become a strong shield for ourselves wherever we go and uh, anywhere, even with the, the society, with the, the, the people, and even in the jungle, even in the, the forest, anywhere we go, if we develop this compassion and loving kindness, it's going to become uh, one of the best tool for ourselves to, to be safe and at the same time do good for other people. So somehow, end of this all, we look for our inner development. So through this sutra, so out of the similes, uh, the, one of the important th thing that we can gain, it talk about the how to develop the tranquility state. That means how to develop the undisturbed mind. And at the same time, the out of that undisturbed mind, not to remain the same, but it, it show how you can transform 
and develop the very vipassana level of mind so that's how that out of this four elements reflect on that it give the 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 deeper understanding to come out of this the idea of self so in that way finally i think it give a direction to have a comfortable life and at the same time we do our best and share our life and at the same time spiritually we transform and get into the final liberation of the nibbana so that is what i want to add thank you that was beautiful bante santosh sobhan yeah, especially uh, linking with the four elements and trying to see uh, how uh, uh, we can you know we can blend with these elements and understand the dhamma uh, also in view of the sutra here that the buddha is taking earth taking a cat skin bag and taking a saw and all these examples are given for us to say uh, you can remain calm the earth cannot be unearthed a cat skin bag cannot be wrinkle free um, no matter what you do and all these are pointing at something that cannot be changed in other words your patience that remains uh, stable remains unaffected your loving kindness that remains unaffected no matter the conditions are so that's the beauty of uh, discussing dhamma and uncovering these realities and also being creative with what the buddha has taught i see bante uh, santa sanata vihari has uh, raised his hand and been waiting uh, over to you bante Uh, thank you, Bante, Vandana Bante. Uh, I was reminded of the verse from the Maha Mangala Sutta, the Puttasa Loka Dhammehi, Chittam Yasena Kampati, right? That uh, our mind shouldn't be uh, perturbed by when it comes in contact with the worldly dhammas, the Ataloka dhammas, the Lava, Alava, Yasa, Ayasa, Ninda, Prasansa, and Sukha and Dukkha. That uh, no matter which one we uh, face, our mind should be always uh, unperturbed right undisturbed um you know and um one of my messages that i've been trying to communicate especially for monks in the west is uh to go outside more because monks are in the temple too much and when they go around they're in a car you know and usually within their own communities like sri lankan or thai and like bante ananda was saying everything's very nice right conditions are very nice but uh you know i ride the bus three times a week and ride the train and i walk a lot and uh most people are not nice to me <laughs> you know and that helps keep things in perspective right uh people make fun of me sometimes real good jokes even i laugh i'm like oh that's very good uh, uh some people um speak very aggressively some people have even you know tried to hurt me physically um some people come trying to push their own you know spiritual views on me and things like that and when you're on the bus no one cares that you're a monk they'll push you out of the way you know there's no meta there <laughs> and on the public transportation people are trying to go somewhere they're trying to go to work uh so in, in those situations you can see you know um your level of practice and i think that we can all benefit from that and i think that's why the buddha wanted all the monks to walk right during the time of the buddha the monks are always traveling and walking and there was no monasteries like nowadays right and, uh, they had to face the people and they face many dangers when you read like the vinaya you see all the dangers that the monks faced uh, when they were out on the road and now we don't face those dangers especially if you live in a asian this country you're like a king you know <laughs> everything's very nice uh, but i think some of you bantes over here in america have also experienced some difficult times right uh, people maybe not being so nice to you so that's one of the messages i try to put out there to all the monastics is that go walk around your neighborhood you know and go out there and see what happens to you and then you'll see 
how your practice is, you know, when uh, you're not surrounded by Buddhist people. It's a different world out there. Uh, and also this sutta, you know, how, how do we get to this great level of uh, patience? Um, you know, and I, what came to mind was the practice of the Brahma Viharas, right? We start first with metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. And at that upeka level, we reach that patience level. Uh, so you can see here together, if we put metta and upeka, and you have the same thing, right? So patience is nothing different as the Bantes were saying earlier from loving kindness, loving kindness and patience. You, you can't have one without the other, right? You can't jump straight to opeka uh, without metta. You need it there. Uh, so it's a very important aspect. And then I wanted to share just some more like practical things that I found in my own research. Um, there was a study that was conducted a few years ago about the, the benefits of mindfulness meditation and the benefits of loving kindness slash compassion meditation. Uh, when it comes to negative rumination, that means negative thoughts, right? Uh, usually about hatred towards others or towards themselves, right? These kind of negative attitudes. And they found that through the practice of sati, uh, mindfulness, uh, one is less likely to react when these uh, uh, angry thoughts, right? Negative thoughts appear. It gives you that more equanimity to face those uh, angry thoughts. And through the practice of loving kindness slash compassion meditations, uh, you are less likely to have angry thoughts, right? So if we put these together, you practice metta compassion meditations, you'll have less angry thoughts. And if you practice sati also, when you do have an angry thought, you're less likely to react, right? So these are two beautiful tools that we can use in our everyday practice. And uh, in the beginning, yes, we need to practice at the temple or maybe in a nice cushion like I'm sitting here in a room. But as the Bantes were saying also, uh, we need to take the practice outside, right? We need to, in our actions and our words, our words have to be words of loving kindness and compassion, right? And we have to be mindful in everything that we do. Like the Buddha said, even when we're going to the bathroom, right? You have to have sati. So if we're always practicing sati and always practicing metta, then we will not end up like this lady, right? We won't fall into this trap because we have these skills that we've been uh, uh, developing ahead of time. And I think sometimes when it comes to developing these skills of sati and metta, people try to use them in the last moment, right? It's like the house is on fire and then they want to call the, the firefighter, right? And then here comes sati and here comes metta. But uh, when the firefighters come, if your house is on fire already, uh, all they're going to do is turn off the fire, but your house is already ruined. You know, they're not going to save your house. Your house is already burnt. But if you install alarms, right, if you have a fire extinguisher, if you have an, uh, all these kind of protective factors, then your house is less likely to get on fire. And if it does, you can turn it off right away or the firefighters can come before the house gets consumed in flames. So we need to practice sati every day from the moment that we wake up to when we go to sleep, like the Buddha said, uh, and also metta, in, like in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, from the moment we wake up to when we go to sleep. And that's the way you get the full benefits. You have to live a more kindful life, right? As Bhante says, <laughs> uh, more kindful Canada, right? So we need to practice mindfulness and kindfulness together to be protected, Bhante. That was beautiful, Bhante. Um, I like you started with Mangala Sutta, where you um, brought up Putta Suloka Dhammihi, unaffected by these eight worldly conditions. And you went on to explain the importance of being patient uh, and also leaving your comfort zone, walking in the neighborhood, not being in a car and seeing the city, not being in that same community. I have personally felt myself living uh, in many places, many monasteries that uh, when it, you know, when it's past three months, I know it's the time, it's enough time to build relationship with contacts around that area and I realized this is the time to leave. If I stay, they will definitely keep, you know, even three months is enough uh, to uh, have enough information about the community and sometimes uh, there can be this attachment or there can be this aversion in you that I don't like these people, I don't like th those people and these 
experiences reveal to me that this is why the Buddha asked monks to travel. Uh, do not stay in the same place uh, forever. Experience other people. And in doing so, you experience yourself. You uncover parts that are not awakened in you yet. And then you you know what you can do uh, with your practice. I, I really liked, uh, Bhante said, uh, how uh, the four Brahma Vihara uh, can be used, utilized in our practice. And that reminded me of uh, the Metta Sahagata Sutta, also called the Halidavasana Sutta, where the Buddha says, practice mindfulness with the four sublime states. And that means practice mindfulness with metta, practice mindfulness with karuna, practice mindfulness with mudita, practice mindfulness with upekha. And I talked and uh, thought, you know, how can you practice loving kindness and mindfulness together? And that uh, made me realize that, you know, being loving and kind to your body and being mindful at the same time and being loving and kind. Uh, in other actions that you do, do using your body and being uh, free from uh, angry uh, angry thoughts, repulsive anger. And that way you are practicing, uh, you are being mindful of loving kindness in your body, outside and in your thoughts. So this sutra has uh, seven factors of awakening and each should be practiced with the four Brahma Vihara, four sublime states. And that gives us an opportunity to practice uh, the last awakening factor, equanimity, also with a sublime state of equanimity, awakening factor of equanimity with a sublime state of equanimity. So seven into four, 48 ways of practicing uh, has been taught in this sutra. And it's amazing to realize that and see these are the tools for monks and when they know these tools instead of staying in one place you definitely take these tools and test in the neighborhood and see oh can i handle this person i clearly remember some you know at, at this occasion we were in Mos uh, in st petersburg far away from moscow and these people from russia they thought we can read their palm and and so they came, they were drunk at the same time, and they they came to us and gave their hands to read, and we didn't know how to speak Russian, and we said, no, we don't do that, um, and they started cursing us. They started <laughs> they were so upset that we we didn't do palm reading, and here uh, in this country, in the United States, uh, taxi drivers sometimes in New York City, uh, they have seen these movies of Shaolin monks and they ask, you know, do you know martial arts? And they do this to us. <laughs> so I, this makes me think, you know, should I pretend like I know for my safety or should I, should I actually be honest and say, no, I don't know any martial arts. So these are experiences that monks, uh, monks have when you are out and about doing your thing. So uh, of course, there's this rush outside. In uh, you know, when you try to get into a bus, people push you away, or they are in a, they are not in a patient state of mind. They are rushing to get to some place, and then you can test your patience. You know, can you uh, look at that person with kindly eyes, and can you not uh, feel irritated? Just seeing how how much you can appreciate that you don't have anger in you at that time, that you are so free, and that you can tolerate these moments. Um, I think in Jataka stories you find you you find these uh, tapasa uh, hermits. They have long beard, and children go and pull from this beard, and he is not upset. These are children. Children do these things and you speak kindly to the children. Sometimes children may expect you to uh, give a strong reaction, like taking a stone and 
uh, whooping them or uh, saying some bad words, but you instead choose loving kindness and do not say anything. You observe your mind and the beauty of your mind. And that way in Halidavasana Sutra also, uh, the Buddha says, when you practice seven awakening factors with four sublime states, it brings your mind to, uh, with loving kindness, it brings your mind to a state called Subha Vimokka, deliverance uh, of your mind into something, some state of mind called beautiful. Subha. Everything you see is beautiful. Even the ugliest things, the most repulsive thing that you see is beautiful. Uh, it, it can be objects and it can be emotions that are ugly and you see the beauty in them. So if um, if I go back to the Kakachu Kama Sutta, we, are, uh, we, we, we learned about Venerable Molia Paguna. Uh, I you know, thought maybe he had some sort of attachment to perhaps just assuming, forgive me for this wrong assumption, it may be a completely wrong assumption that he had attachment toward one of the nuns. But not even associating when we Paguna with this, that when you personally observe your mind, that you're occupied with someone or something, and then somebody tells you something and you don't even listen to, you don't hear them talking. That is because your mind is full of someone, some person, something. And they try to say more about whatever they are trying to say and it can irritate you. I have seen children getting irritated by uh, mom and uh, all that this mom has done is to just make a tea and bring to their son. It's a loving activity, kind activity, kindful action. But the child is occupied with a computer game or uh, their cell phone. Uh, some uh, emotions, you know, their intelligence is hijacked by uh, computer games, electronics, hormones, and emotions, and all kinds of things. So they can't appreciate what their mom did. They can't appreciate what their dad did. So th this is where you see, um, I think, Venerable Molia Faguna's case. Uh, reveals, every time you read it, it reveals something new to you that, oh, this is how a defiled state of mind works. And then be like earth. More uh, someone use an instrument and try to make the earth look like not the earth, unearth it. It's impossible. Why? Because your mind is free of free from defilement acts calmly and accepts criticism and observe how your mind reacts or does not react. What your mind is doing when you are doing all these activities. So that's the beauty of your practice. And I think seeing that is Dhamma Nupasana. Seeing that is observing your mind. You know, observing your mind is a practice of meditation, Chitta Nupasana seeing how much lust is present in it. What is your character, anger character? Or is it anger plus lustful, attachment, desire person, desire-driven character? And how can we undo this? How can, we, how can we be like the earth? How can we be like that person whose limbs are being cut but still remains in uh, loving kindness? Like the story of the Queen Samavati. She knew that she was in danger. The whole palace was burning in flame, and she and her 500 friends were being burnt. And the only last piece of advice she gave to all the ladies was, stay in loving kindness. Do not spread hatred. Do not choose the easy thing. Do not get angry. And that way, of course, their lives ended, but they were born in a greater realm, a realm of happiness. Somewhere there's no anger, there's so much freedom. I mean, they are not completely free from anger, but they are in a happier realm. So I will stop talking, and I, I, I see Bhante um, Alubovila Ananda would like to um, 
add more to this discussion. Over to you, Bhante. Actually, Bhante, when uh, Bhante Shantasobhan was mentioning that uh, Earth uh, parable, I just uh, remembered one very beautiful uh, sutra, uh, which is the Shantivadi Jataka story. Uh, in uh, in Buddha's uh, when Buddha before he attained Buddhahood, uh, and it's a very graphic story of uh, how this ultimate uh, patience can be. It's, it's very very graphic. That's why I want to share it. Uh, so for people who haven't heard about Shantivadi Jataka story, um, it wasn't Buddha yet. He wasn't enlightened yet. He was in the path of being enlightened, and that at that time he was called the Mahavira, which means that uh, who has a lot of courage and. Uh, Long story short, uh, there was this monk, a hermit, who was uh, uh, doing his meditation, and there was the king who was uh, uh, coming and visiting that area, and they had a lot of she, he had a lot of uh, concubines. So when the king was sleeping, the concubines uh, went to the monk and uh, the hermit, and uh, they started a conversation. And when the king woke up, he saw that the concubines were not around, and then he got really mad about it. And then uh, he went and asked the hermit, "What's your?" What's your philosophy? Then he said, my philosophy is Shantipata, which means uh, that I practice the ultimate patience. So then what King did was the very graphic part. He ordered the monk to be uh, stripped and uh, whipped. And uh, he even went to the extent of chopping off the limbs, chopping off the nose and uh, covered in blood. And still the uh, hermit said, my, my uh, uh, philosophy is Shantivada. I do not hate you. Now, that's a very graphic story. And uh, uh, the, the part of what I want to link is that how do you become that? And uh, the closest example I have uh, seen uh, of a person being very patient uh, is my father and mother. And uh, probably again, Venerable uh, Shant Sarbani can relate to it because my father... Uh, was a three-time champion in judo in Sri Lanka and then he practiced a lot of uh, martial arts in Japan and uh, when you go through a practice like that and especially when you have the power to crush someone with your physical ab ability and still you become so patient and you know you don't get provoked I think there's a lot of practice involved in it but I think uh, even if you do a martial art again I'm not the most expert because I have never done anything of that sort uh, even when you do a martial art, I think one part is the mere practice. But the other part is, I think, the more deeper one, which is the mindfulness. Uh, now, I have seen uh, how the Marines are trained uh, in the US, like even when they are exposed to a situation where you take them and put them under uh, underwater, but they don't panic. So they are trained to not to be panicked. And again, if you look at how the firefighters and uh, uh, paramedics, they are trained to not to panic. Even again, uh, back in Sri Lanka, we saw that sometimes there, there's this uh, cops who are, uh, you know, in front of a uh, uh, angry crowd. But uh, even if the crowd does something, they don't get angry to that. So they're trained to do that, which is, I think, a trainable feature. You can even train a dog to uh, not bark at uh, other dogs if you're properly trained. But uh, just beyond that training, I I'm sure that even uh, regardless of this training, that training has a breaking point. Uh, like we mentioned in this Kakachupan Sutra, there, there must be a breaking point even uh, in this training. But uh, going beyond the training, when you uh, practice your mindfulness, that uh, you get to the root of it. So I'm sure that even to that training, a fair amount of mindfulness has to be there. But uh, like uh, when Bhante uh, Santavihara mentioned the four Brahma Vihara, Viharas, the, the adopts, abodes of the Brahmas, uh, Metta Karana Mudita Upeka, in order to go there, you need to have that... Uh, extreme levels of mindfulness, especially to go to that uh, level of equanimity. And uh, I think also, uh, uh, now this, this Shanti is most often associated with anger, but I think uh, probably because the reason that anger is the most abrasive and the most uh, prominent version out of uh, delusion, desire and anger, uh, hatred, that, that hatred and anger is the more uh, obvious one. But uh, Shanti, when you, when you practice in the most subtle states of mind uh, with desire, like uh, even at uh, Arupa level, you still have a desire. Uh, you know, forget the normal, uh, the, the more obvious uh, desires that you have, but even if you go to more meditative stages of Rupa Dhyana, Arupa Dhyana, you still have that desire. And uh, how do you become uh, uh, patient in that or practice your shanti in that. And then even the, the further lower ones like delusion, how do you practice that? Because in, in this Kakachu Kama Sutra, Buddha also mentioned, mentioned the word kusala. So a kusala, 
meaning loga desha moha and kusala being the opposite of that how do you practice the patience in that so that's what i wanted to uh, mention bhante thank you bhante ananda for uh, enlightening us more um, especially talking about um, your life's own examples and also bringing up shanti vadu jataka um, i'm sure your father perhaps did not want you to learn martial arts i don't know the connection there um some parents who have mastered it definitely want the next generation to learn it uh, but um with with martial arts or without martial arts you have chosen the path of being a monk which is i think becoming a greater warrior in your life uh, much um, greater than um, stopping at the level of martial arts and going beyond and seeing how can you be a true warrior uh, winning your own heart winning your own mind winning your own path and then never losing ever again so uh, i admire you for um, these wonderful uh, insights that you bring to the discussion but um, i also forgot to mention one more thing actually the most i have seen my father practicing patience is with my mother <laughs> <laughs> because she was a very neurotic person and uh, that's when i see him uh, practicing patience the most so i think uh, for all the lay people who are listening especially in your, when you're in a relationship when you're married that's a perfect uh, place to practice your patience <laughs> uh, so who was the most patient one <laughs> was was it your mother or your father my father my father, my father. <laughs> I think I like to hear from your mom <laughs> what she has to say. So um I see Bante Tetsala joining from Sri Lanka. Good morning Bante. Um Bante uh, has raised his hand and would like to join. Um, we always love to hear what Bante Tetsala has to say. So over to you. Uh, Tetsala Sanay Bante, I hope you can hear me. and may my yeah may my vandana to all bantes and uh, i uh, lately joined to the discussion and i i was hearing the discussion through youtube and i thought to uh, come and because today i was a, unable because i had i am having some sicknesses uh, but uh, i i i i thought that i would uh, definitely add something because this sutta is not uh, in the beginning bante mentioned that uh, maybe uh, this is a very little sutta that's why most monks are not connecting actually it is not like that this is very one of the very important and it is very you know without this i mean this teaching we cannot proceed towards the, uh, uh, we cannot work as a monk in the at the end of the sutra buddha mentioned bante because if you keep this advice on the simile of the so constantly in your mind do you see any cause of speech or trivial or gross that you could not endure then monks replied that no vendable sir therefore no vendable sir and further buddha said therefore because you should keep this advice on the simile of the so constantly in your mind that will lead to your welfare and happiness for long time in it is mentioned bante that uh, it mean in in when we are living in the world as bhikkhus so as lay people at any time there is no any space for us to take the anger and angry mind there is no any chance at any time we have to be patient so you know the most thing uh, which can come from the external is the death no people may kill us but still we have to maintain the patient with loving kindness so in the commentaries bant it's beautiful uh, uh, dhamma factor is mentioned like you know uh, if there is a vendor and he is very cunning he is always trying to find money and he using uh, very cunning tricks to uh, deceive people and take the money so this is kind of a trick that has to be used by the monks and if he, if, if monk monks can maintain a life where there is no hatred in his mind he can directly reach to the nibbana like that of that uh, cunning vendor he is directly earning money from by deceiving people uh, you know in the in the same way 
if monk can maintain uh, this kind of a life without anger you know uh, i mean according to this sutra we don't have any chances to create any anger in our minds no at that time we are like that like that particular vendor and we don't give any chances we are deceiving completely the mara and we can directly arrive to the nibbana so that is the advice of the buddha in the at the end of the sutra so i wanted to add that uh, add this thing uh, to the this to this discussion bante that's why i joined uh, thank you bante for providing me the opportunity so so hope you feel better very soon bante pesala and uh, having listened to youtube um, you still decided to join um, it's an honor for us and um, the monks join you to wish you a uh, speedy recovery from whatever is bothering you uh, obviously physically and also quoting a very important piece from the sutra and highlighting that this sutra or any sutra that we have been discussing is not trivial and without yes. this without this uh, we monks obviously cannot entertain anger in any moment in our life so no chance there and uh, the part that you quoted is uh, super important so the monks it revealed to monks that there is no chance for you to act in anger uh, or say anything in anger think anything in, in anger and that is like the core the foundation of your monastic uh, behavior monastic life monastic presentation um, monastic attitude monkness in you thank yes, you for that thank you so much next we have uh, bante santa sobana again like to join and share his wisdom so thank you very much yes. and uh, i want to add some uh, details to our venerable monks and uh, it's not about martial art <laughs> so actually uh, it, it can be about I martial art if you like <laughs> yeah actually <laughs> when, when we practice martial art what happens it's it's mostly we start to recognize our inner nature and uh, because when we fail inside us that is where we going to fight with others so that, that's why when uh, when we practice martial art it give a more self discipline to ourselves and deeper understanding about our own behavior so that is how it ca it can master uh, with the outside so uh, when it come to our day to day life whoever listen this because i know there are a lot of uh, uh, followers uh, through the facebook and the uh, youtube so most of us every day look for happiness and satisfaction but uh, just praying just looking for that wishing for that and uh, waiting for it we not going to get it we have to understand the very nature of the world the world itself has its own nature and it not going to change because of us so it is better than we have to develop some inner qualities within ourselves as uh, venerable uh, ananda mentioned that santivadi jataka it's it's a kind of like a very great uh, uh, story and it's kind of like a give us a role model like uh, when we practice loving kindness and compassion uh, it it shows us how far we can go and the, the limits because sometimes most of time people hold it to limits or oh, this is my limit but uh, when it come to that shantivadi jataka and it shows and uh, how far we can go and at the same time most of time when situations happen we think why it happened to me but we have to understand it is not only for us and at the same way when we go practice the the loving kindness and the compassion and we have to understand it is not just by ourselves it has done by lot of spiritual masters is there that uh, it has done by yons by yons all the buddhas and all the enlightened masters and all we are not alone in this path so that give a kind of like a strength and courage for us to understand and uh, i want to go a little bit more deeper with our venerable sanatana vihari mentioned this 
uh, understanding and the compassion. So that is a very important part because when it comes to loving kindness and compassion, and uh, we need to know from the, the, the other side, because the, the greed and the hatred, it's always going to be there and it is so strong. So the compassion and loving kindness, developing this and the, with the awareness, if we can develop it, it's going to become the, uh, the best uh, vaccine for the, the hatred. So, and one of the very fundamental quality in the world, there is nothing can exist itself. So when it comes to anger, hatred, it always going to come with something. Anger itself cannot arise. There is no way. So anger most of time come with the, the, the lust. So sometimes when the people want to get out of the anger, they just keep struggling with their own thoughts. And, uh, but they maybe have something holding to themselves. And when it comes to loving kindness and compassion also, most of the time people try to practice loving kindness and compassion, but end of the day, they're going to end up being mad. Why? Because we hold, they, they hold it to something and out of that attachment, they try to practice loving kindness and compassion, but it doesn't work. Why? Because if we hold it to something, it's always going to fund for the hatred or the anger or the disappointment or the unhappiness or the fear. So then it is very important. We have to understand when we develop the path, if anybody want to develop the loving kindness and compassion, it always need to develop with the awareness or the sati or the clarity or the understanding, not the attachment. So if, 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 if anybody want to get out of the anger, Rather than struggling with the, the surplus level, they have to look into a little bit deeper what they hold and where the attachment go. If they are capable to release that, and they then it will help them to get out of it. Somehow, end of this all, we have to understand whatever situation come and uh, we have to remember. We all live, live in this the world and we all are sharing the same yeah, same space, same earth, and we all are, end of the day, brothers and sisters and mother, mothers and fathers, children and parents, and there's no separation. And even, even though today, maybe we, we, we can draw a line, but someday it's going to be part of us. So if we can a little bit think deeply, and I think in, in any situation, and personally, we can overcome that. So I hope that whoever listen this and uh, out of this, our discussion, and they can get this lesson and practice themselves because without practicing, there is no way we can gain this. So if anybody willing to practice and that person can develop it. So loving kindness and compassion is kind of like uh, muscles. When you practice with the muscles, you can grow it. You can make it strong. It's the same like the brain. When you practice with the loving kindness and compassion, your brain, your nerve system, your some uh, that the deeper this immune system going to change. So, if you practice it, then you can gain the benefit. But you can't practice it in your comfort zone. Always, you have to come out of it. And, not, and you no need to be afraid to do something new or find a new way. So as example, when, it, when we go to this uh, Jataka stories, all the, the 550 Jatakas, if we see very carefully, each and every Jataka story telling us, it, it introducing something new rather than going in the same way, applying the same method, and it always give us an idea to look in a different way and it opening a new window and it give us an opportunity for us to experience this life and at the same time become a better person 
and and at the same way to give a comfort to other people through that way sharing our life and caring each other and develop our our life so somehow end of this all what we look conventionally happiness and satisfaction and eternally our liberation so get to gain that we have to remember only way just practicing ourselves so i think this this teachings this sutras this information give us a very clear uh, a strong platform for that thank you thank you bante uh, it's very beautiful when you said the muscles of compassion uh, muscles of loving kindness and mindfulness um and this connects with the comment that came in zoom um it says uh, don't some japanese buddhists take anger as a positive force but obviously to combat com- combat the obstacles in the physical world um and so japanese buddhists is uh, what i see in here um it's not only from that part of the world even here we um, in in the west we hear righteous anger using anger to get things done uh and connecting that with the wisdom of the buddha i see that the buddha sometimes highlight that wisdom has to go hand in hand um with the muscles that you develop the buddha says mansani tassa vaddanti panya tassa na vaddati uh, so uh, as you connect it with the modern world everyone says follow your heart and your heart may say be angry and get things done but i think it's a millennial trap you know follow your heart is a millennial trap perhaps we should say follow your heart but take your brain with you so with that that said the thing about the wisdom aspect that you can have as you are going about doing things in the world and there's no way you can express anger without feeling that force in you so therefore uh, if you die in a moment where you are expressing your anger that's very harmful to you so uh, the court that we hear these things can be beautiful but the wisdom aspect has to be applied and understood uh, and the value of patience should be seen in all these situations i see bante um, is that bante tridao yes yes where do you join from it's uh, a dark place somewhere uh- <laughs> <laughs> it's just, this is so sketchy. <laughs> I first and foremost salutations to all of the venerables um that is present here today. I apologize first and foremost for not being present on the 50th anniversary because I was expecting the banner and everything and usually <laughs> venerable Sarnampala sends me a, a reminder oh. and hmm. and and also I you know I just didn't want any, anyone to think that oh venerable Sarnampala is, is not here so venerable oh. Chidao magically disappeared. <laughs> at the right now i'm with a, a group of students that i am training and uh, actually going through what th- today's discussion is about teaching them tolerance endurance and patience buying through the methods of the buddha which also includes uh loving kindness and i like to contribute today beginning with our world is changing at a very fast rate the the rate of hate the unprecedented speed of hate buying through social media um is disheartening uh, to all of us and if the buddha is watching himself he, he i i believe he would be shaking his head left to right however the rare and few dharma warriors out there who are listening and watching you all can inspire by and through your own change question becomes how do we become more patient when our neighbors are not how can we become more patient when uh, we get in line to pay for groceries and the person you know 
I can't believe there's only three cashiers. You know, I can't believe where's the manager. And we see more and more examples of road rage, more and more examples on the road, on the media, about how people are not patient, uh, not caring, not loving, not kind, not mindful. <clears throat> yeah, not um, so. Compassion arises out of deep understanding. So when you understand people, when you understand their brain, when you understand their minds, you're more likely to have compassion for them. You know, when uh, when you're in traffic and someone cuts in front of you, did it ever occur to you? that maybe he's on his way to see his pregnant wife who's going to give birth. Did it ever occur to you that maybe he's probably looking for a bathroom? <laughs> he probably needs to go attend to nature's call. And, you know, we, we don't do that, right? We, we let our preset biological causes and conditioning, which is we think that they are attacking us. He cuts in front of me because I think how, how dare he does that to me? This is my car. This is my expensive car. So we take it very personal. The incorporation and clinical benefits of the practice of anatta lakana, the practice of the non-self, makes us takes, takes things a little bit less personal, to see things truly as they are, to see things in an alternative, kindful, mindful, wise way. And that leads to more tolerance. That leads you to the ability to endure and to be more patient with your neighbors. And as we reflect on the one and only human race, you know, everyone's got a mom, everyone's got a dad. People are going through things that we may not know. You have to look past the behavior and into the person past the behavior and into the person in order for compassion to arise. If you can do that, you are one skillful Dharma warrior, Dhamma warrior. So it is, it is a challenge in this lifetime. I would agree with all of you who are sitting and watching and reflecting that yes, yes, when everyone is doing it, we shouldn't. We should be the noble. We should be the wise. We should not be a fool. We should really try to practice self-restraint, supreme level of self-restraint. Let us never forget, the Buddha said, I know not of anything that brings great happiness, such as a mind that is well-restrained, well-attended to, and is well-disciplined. That meant, and that means, that all of us should always attend to our mind should always discipline our mind and always restrain our mind, restrain the habitual mind, restrain the habitual anger. We must trace the links of influence. Why are we so angry? What did we see? What do we remember when we were younger? Who was angry in our family first? Was it our mom? Was it our dad? The practice of Paticca Samupada helps you trace and because people run away from the pain of the family history, no one wants to face the pain head on. But in Buddhism, we encourage you to face it one last time. If you can uproot it one last time, then you will have more roses and less thorns in your life. If you do not heed the advice of the wise, let me tell you what will happen. Every day, there are more prisons being built. Every day, the justice center is becoming bigger, more judges, more handcuffs, more prison cells. What does that mean? Why is this related to everything that we're talking about? Simple. If you're not mindful, you, you tend to make more mistakes. The mistakes of anger is a detrimental, magnificent type of mistake yet to be experienced. And there are cameras everywhere. You know. What's good is always going to be good and what is not is not. You can spark an argument quickly. You can get into a fist fight. What are you going to do? Are you going to try to justify it in a court of law when there's cameras everywhere? 
when everyone has a cell phone to capture it. Yeah, you know. So uh, uh, again, you know, it goes both ways. If you do not heed the advice of the wise, then you will pay dearly. You know, it's your suffering, your life, your bail bonds. You know, not not us. We're here to just invite you to reconsider the potential and likely chance, the consequences that could arise. I take I take the subject of anger very seriously. Uh, you know, experiencing it for myself. You know, growing up as a very angry young man, and um, it it cost me dearly. It cost me my relationship. It cost. You know, I wasn't. You know, I didn't sit there and play with Barbie dolls all day long. I was a very angry child. By and through Buddhism, it changed me, changed my life, saved my life. I would be, I would, I would be in prison for, if it wasn't for the practice. Um, but, you know, back in the day, we can get away with a lot of things because there were no witnesses around. But nowadays, you have cameras all over, street cameras, dash cameras, cell phones. You can't win. I'm telling you, you can't win. If you let anger win and proliferate, forget it. You will end up sitting in prison meditating. You know, and hopefully achieving nirvana in there. So anyways, I like everyone to reconsider this subject, a very profound and necessary reminder. Reminder as if, you know, people are going to church every Sunday, always being reminded. So when we have these bi-weeklies, let the Dhamma discussions be nurturing for your spirit, be nurturing for your mind, and a constant reminder to never, ever give in to anger. You must... Pro, you must win this fight with the three poison, anger, greed, ignorance. You must be the lion's roar towards the end of your life, victorious. And even the gods and the devas and the celestial beings will look at you and smile and said, Sadhu, well done. You've done it. Thank you for letting me contribute as we uh, come to the end of this biweekly. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Tridao. Very insightful, especially addressing the young generation. Um, so, conclusion is that one minute of patience can give you 10 years of peace. With that, I invite Venerable um, Shantasobhana to recite the Ova the Party Mokka to end our discussion. And thank you to all the Venerable Monks for joining today and um, making this a very useful time together. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So thank you very much, Venerable Sirs. And uh, doing this uh, discussion, we accumulated a lot of merits. We transfer that all merits to all the guardian angels and deities and all the Venerable Monks and nuns and whoever participate with this uh, session. May all of you stay healthy and safe and may no harm come to you, may no difficulties come to you, may no problems come to you. Finally, may all of you attain supreme bliss of liberation as you wish. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Anti paramang tapo titika nibbanang paramang vadanti buddha nahi pabbajito paro pragati samano hoti parang vihetayanto sab papas karanam kusalas upasampada sachit pariyo dapanam etam buddhan sasanam anupavado anupagato Ati mokket sangvaro matang yuta che bhaktas ming pantan che sayanasanang adi chite che ayogo etang Buddhan Sasanam Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu. Thank you, Venerable uh, Santa Sobhana. Thank you to all the Venerable Monks.
and good night from Boston, USA.